the start of the 60s, something extraordinary was happening in the British entertainment industry. A new sound had been born in Liverpool. The pop music moguls had abandoned their American acts and found an explosion of homegrown talent in the pubs and clubs of Britain's provincial cities. The pathway to money and fame taken by scores of those young hopefuls in the heady days of the beat group era was this, just a zebra crossing over a suburban street in North London. Or at least, that's all it was, until the Beatles put it on an LP cover and fixed Abbey Road forever in the history of rock music. The zebra crossing leads to EMI's Abbey Road Studios and to the recording contracts that made a lot of young kids from the provinces into household names. Abbey Road hasn't all been pop music. Studio One here was the biggest classical music studio in the world before the Beatles were born. Names like Maria Callas and Herbert von Karajan cut their discs here as well. And it was with Sir Edward Elgar conducting the London Symphony Orchestra here in this room that the studios were opened 50 years ago. <laughs> The first memory of Studio One was the day I actually arrived in Abbey Road when we, Peter Dawson was singing on the road to Mandalay. And it was always used then, or chiefly used, for cla big classical orchestras. And as a whole string of orchestras came in, with a lot of famous names, Sir Thomas Beecham, Sir John Barbarelli, uh, Sir Malcolm Sargent, all these orchestras need to be conducted by somebody called Sir. Um, we did a course in there, we did um, the Beatles, um, satellite link across the world in I think it was 1967 I think and that was an amazing scene because hundreds of people got in from outside and all rushed through the studio I remember that quite vividly this is Steve Race in the Beatles recording studio in London where the latest Beatle record is at this moment being built up not just a single performance but a whole montage of performances with some friends in to help the atmosphere, this is quite an occasion. I remember going home and saying to my wife that they seemed a bit arty. I can't, looking back now, I can't remember why I said that, but you know, that's my initial impression. They were, they were quite different from other people. But, in that era, anybody that had long hair was um, a classical musician. And so the long haired lot were the classical people and not the pop people. And that sort of changed the trend from then on. But when you got round as far as making their first disc, Love Me Do, what kind of impression? Oh, I mean, immediately they started making records properly and the impression was fantastic. And the whole buzz about the building was, was amazing. It was in Studio Two that the Beatles and all the other rock musicians made their distinctive sounds. It's strange to think of so much adulation, money and hype being generated from this one rather scruffy old room. In 1963, a five-strong band from Manchester came for an audition and landed a contract. 30 albums and 50 singles later, three of them are still recording here and they're still called The Hollies. of the Hollies singles cut in this room have made the charts. Take My Love and Run is their newest attempt. I mean, 
of those days, you could record an album in three hours. It was just like doing a live thing straight onto, straight onto tape. It was better in many ways, because you knew when you came in that you had to actually play and sing, and that had to be it. It wasn't a case of, oh, well, let's just get the cowbell down and we'll build it from there. It'll be wonderful. That's taken out a lot of, a lot of magic away. But I'll tell you something funny, it's only like in the last couple of years that I've been coming into Abbey Road and people have been saying to me, this is the room where it all happened. You know, and I was saying, I know, I was there. Made 25 <laughs> hits, then. And it's very nostalgic <laughs> to walk into this particular room because this is, I don't think they've repainted it in 18 years, mm -hmm. you know, because they want, they want to keep the sound. And it does keep it, it's, it's a great little studio, a lot of memories in here, a lot so of nostalgia. Funny, but it's true. When Helen Shapiro made Walking Back to Happiness in Studio 2, it was a story for the Look at Life documentaries. Helen was then only 14 years old. I have loved you more each day, walking back to happiness. Oh, oh, yeah. Said goodbye to loneliness. Oh, oh, yeah. This is the first time, actually, that I've been in here since 1967. And it, it's a, a, a strange feeling walking in the front entrance here. I mean, the whole thing is so changed. It's much more jazzy and uh, together and modern. You know, in the old days, it was like it was just a series of corridors. And you didn't know which door was which. And now it's all with photographs of everybody and the whole thing. But it's a wonderful, warm feeling to, to come back here. But the studio hasn't changed. The studio, too, is exactly the same as last time I saw it. They've still got the real old-fashioned big speakers on the wall. The only thing that's different is a film screen, because I believe they do film scores here now. But apart from that, it's quite amazing that it hasn't changed at all. Why have you never changed Studio 2? Why does it look much as it did when the Hollies or the Beatles first walked in to record there in 1963-4? The main reason we haven't say, changed Studio 2 acoustically, we changed it quite technically in the control room, is that quite a lot of artists um, like the sound there, particularly the string sound and the vocal sounds. But we are going to change it because you can't live in the past. And unless we're going to make it into a museum, then we've got to change it. And we hope to do that within the next, the next year. In Studio One, Yehudi Menuhin has been making a 50th anniversary record with the same orchestra who opened Abbey Road, the London Symphony. He first recorded here at the age of 15 with Sir Edward Elgar. Now he's the maestro, bringing on a 12-year-old red Chinese prodigy, Jin Lee. What memories do you have of that first recording here with Sir Edward Elgar in 1931? Oh, very warm ones. The orchestra at that time was on the opposite side of the room. And of course, this room has gone through any number of transformations. Each time there was a new fashion or a new development, um, this room was where it was tried out. And then, of course, the technical developments are enormous. It's extraordinary that he's starting at the most advanced level, whereas I've worked up to it, as it were. The newest album to join the 107,000 tapes stored at Abbey Road has been made by three teenagers from East London called Scarlet Party. For them, just getting a chance to follow so many recording successes is a big boost, but a little bit awesome. You're working here at a time when this studio is celebrating being 50. I mean, does it... it what do you feel about that? How do you feel about it? I'm glad I'm not 50. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just like... It's, it's good, really, because we're, we'll be able to be here for the, uh, for the cake. <laughs> <laughs> The famous faces joining in Abbey Road's birthday party have half a century of tunesmithing and money spinning to celebrate. But in the relentless music business, there's only time for a moment of nostalgia. It's nice having a 50th anniversary, a 50th birthday party, but we're 50 years young, not old, and we've got to look ahead to the future. We're now into digital recording and all these sort of things, and all these things are just part of our heritage. And, you know, we've got to move on from where we are now. Race relations.
Tuesdays on Making a